For other breaking stories, the destructive Tennessee wildfires. Traumatic cell phone video shows a desperate drive to escape here. Sparks and flames shoot across the roadway. Cabins can be seen burning in the woods nearby. Tourists were trapped inside a hotel in Gatlinburg as flames burn just outside. Strong winds drove the fires from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park into nearby towns. Dollywood, the Dolly Parton theme park, is threatened. Danny Roberti of our Knoxville affiliate WVLT is at a sports complex in Gatlinburg where hundreds of people are stranded. Danny, good morning. Good morning. This Red Cross shelter right here is one of just many locations where residents are staying the night after fleeing their homes due to these fast moving wildfires right here in Gatlinburg. Now, 600 are registered here. They've got their pets, the clothes on their backs, and most don't know what they're going to find when they see the sun come up in the morning. Hit the gas! Hit the gas! Cell phone video shows flames surrounding a driver evacuating the area of Gatlinburg, Tennessee, late Monday night. God. Fire threatened to block off the only road to safety. Go, 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 go. At one point, sparks flew over the windshield. Almost every cabin in Chalet Village is burning to the freaking ground. The driver says he was able to escape. It is unclear if everyone was as lucky. Yes. Flames closed in on the Park Vista Hotel in downtown Gatlinburg. People trapped inside recorded video on their cell phones as the fire burned. The lights flickered on and off in the smoke-filled lobby where guests were forced to wear masks. Logan Baker was inside. So they're, they're keeping us in here for now, but the smoke is like really bad in here. At one point, at least 30 structures in Gatlinburg were burning. The Mountain Lodge, a roadside restaurant, was destroyed. Oh my God, it's so hot. High winds caused the Chimney 2 fire, which began in the Smoky Mountains last week, to descend on surrounding towns. Drivers captured the fires cascading down the mountain as they were forced to evacuate. Earlier in the day, smoke blanketed Gatlinburg in an ominous cloud. We're dealing with some very difficult situations here in Gatlinburg. That if you are a person that prays, we could use your prayers. We're going to begin with the severe weather that slammed the Carolinas overnight. It is the latest in a series of violent storms ripping through the south. Heavy wind brought down trees, snapped power lines, and closed roads in South Carolina. This dramatic time-lapse video shows the storm moving through the Atlanta area. Video captured one of several water spouts that touched down off northwest Florida. In just over a day, more than a dozen confirmed tornadoes hit Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Alabama. At least five people are dead. Dozens more have been hurt. Mark Straussman is in Rosalie, Alabama, where residents are learning the extent of the destruction. Mark, good morning. Good morning. You can take a look at this and see why this community is in storm shock after the EF2 tornado came barreling through here with winds up to 135 miles an hour. 20 buildings, including a Baptist church and a shopping plaza, lie in piles of rubble just like this. There's so much that needs to be done that I, I don't know where to start. Connor Hughes, like many here in Jackson County, has returned to what's left of his home. He's struggling to scrape up the essentials of life. I'm just trying to collate some bowls and stuff so I can get something to drink. Hundreds of structures were leveled and thousands of people are without power. Jim Smith lost his business when the twister yeah. hit. My business is gone. It's no big deal. I'll, uh, I'll get it all together and restart. It's coming right at us. Look at this. You can see the path of destruction and ruin. The severe weather system began here in northeast Alabama, blew into Tennessee and Georgia, and then headed for the Carolinas. 100 miles north in Tennessee, the town of Athens is recovering from extensive property damage. We are extremely fortunate that we uh, have not had a fatality at this point. Uh, I think that's something that we're, we're very blessed to be able to say, considering the, the massive amount of damage. The county's mayor became emotional, sharing the story of a family who escaped the worst. In uh, one of our hardest hit areas, a new child came into the world. That family's house had been destroyed, and they made it to the hospital and gave birth this morning. So we had 20 injured and one brand new life.
Otto was the first hurricane ever known to have hit Costa Rica and it caused a national emergency to be declared. In a tweet, Costa Rica's president said that at least nine people had been killed and 2,500 evacuated. He declared three days of national mourning. At least another six people are also known to be missing. Otto battered the country with high winds and torrential rain after it arrived on Thursday morning. Severe weather caused by Otto killed four people in Panama earlier in the week. Now an extensive cleanup operation is underway and among the debris, one dog was rescued. After leaving Costa Rica, Otto weakened into a tropical storm. Little more than two weeks after Italian scientists warned climate change had put much of the country at risk of flooding, parts of the northwest have been inundated by heavy rain. Torrential downpours caused the Piedmont region's Tarnaro River to burst its banks, prompting local officials to ask the government to declare a state of emergency. Two days of continual rain has had a similar impact on Turin, where the Po River also flooded. The region of Liguria has been hit hard and a red alert warning for bad weather issued. Meteorologists have warned of possible gale force winds sweeping in over the coast. In Ventimiglia, near the border with France, five migrants were reportedly swept away after a swell hit the bridge they were living under. Four were saved, but a Nigerian man is still missing, presumed drowned. Clearly the spawning is down this year because there are so few acroporid corals left. We lost about 90% of them in the bleaching event and they'd been impacted by two years of cyclones previous to that. So uh, there just weren't very many adult corals here to spawn. Australia is the largest exporter of coal in the world and we've seen this year really significant support for a massive expansion of the coal industry. So we think the first thing that they need to be doing to take the health of the reef seriously is to start with a ban on new coal mines. China's smog could make it more difficult for people to fight off some infections. The air pollution has traces of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. A team from a university in Sweden took over 800 samples of DNA from humans, animals, and various environments across the globe. In Beijing, the air samples contain DNA from genes that make bacteria resistant to some of the most powerful antibiotics we have, including carbapenems. Carbapenems are a sort of last resort antibiotic doctors can prescribe to treat certain infections caused by resistant bacteria. The team notes there's probably a mix of live and dead bacteria in the air and it's the live bacteria that could be a real threat. Nous n'avons pas mis la valasse, nous prenons deux voies. La voie légale, côté nous pour faire contestation, et voie béton pour nous faire de manifestations pacifiques, actives, pour nous dire non à coup d'état électoral.
Belgian authorities say one of the organisers of this week's riots at a refugee shelter belongs to a radical cell. The person's identity and nationality have not yet been revealed, neither has the nature of the radicalisation. Clashes broke out after a health scare at the camp prompted authorities to seal it off and prevent migrants from leaving. More than 400 asylum seekers were arrested at the centre in the southern town of Homanli, near the Turkish border. From December, Bulgaria will begin extraditing a number of those detained to their native Afghanistan, Prime Minister Boyko Borisov announced on Friday. The flames that engulfed a squalid camp on the Greek island of Lesbos on Thursday night were a reminder that Europe has neither solved nor shed the refugee crisis of 2015. A deal with Turkey to hold back the vast human flow across the Mediterranean is fast unravelling. When 50,000 migrants massed across the sea to Greece, you caused an uproar. You began asking, what would you do if Turkey opens its gates? Look at me. If you go any further, these border gates will be opened. President Erdogan's warning comes in response to the European Parliament's vote on Thursday to call a halt to talks with Turkey over its possible future membership of the European Union. An overwhelming majority of MEPs endorsed the non-binding motion because of what they see as Ankara's disproportionate reaction to a failed coup in July. And the Turkish government has also voiced impatience with the EU for its failure to make good on the promise of visa-free travel for Turkish citizens to Europe. The Deputy Prime Minister spoke to Al Jazeera in London. Previously, six to 10,000 illegal migrants a day were trying to cross from Turkey by land or sea to Greece. Now it has stopped completely. Turkey did what was expected and kept its promise, but Europe didn't fulfill its responsibilities. Therefore, if Europe is not going to give visa-free travel, Turkey will retreat from the deal. So the question that haunts EU leaders is this. Will Turkey reopen the refugee and migrant floodgates into Europe? The answer is not if, but when. Jonah Hull, Al Jazeera. The United Nations says thousands of Rohingya Muslims have arrived in Bangladesh after fleeing ongoing state-sponsored persecution in neighboring Myanmar. Based on reports by various humanitarian agencies, we estimate that there could be 10,000 new arrivals in recent weeks. The situation is fast changing and the actual number could be much higher. Rohingya community leader in Bangladesh says that at least 3,000 Rohingya Muslims are stranded on an island near Bangladesh without sufficient food and clothes. Bangladesh has reinforced border posts and patrols to stop the influx of refugees. The UN Refugee Agency had earlier urged Dhaka to allow the Rohingya to enter the country. The Rohingya community has been forced to leave Myanmar amid extensive discrimination and crackdown by the government. International rights groups have time and again highlighted the plight of the Rohingya, who are described by the UN as the world's most persecuted minority. Students at Ohio State University remain shaken by Monday's campus attack that left 11 people hurt. Responsibility for the car and knife rampage has been claimed by ISIL militants who described the assailant as a soldier. But there's been no confirmation of any connection between Somali-born Abdul Razak Ali Artan, who was himself a student at the university before he was shot Abdul dead by police. The authorities are investigating terrorism as a possible motive, suggesting Artan may have been radicalised online by jihadist propaganda. The United States is poised to put a Somali militant group in its sights. Al-Shabaab is being added to a list of groups the United States is fighting as part of its war on terrorism. CCTV's Daniel Wrenches has our story. On September the 11th, 2001, the world changed. 
when members of Al-Qaeda hijacked passenger planes, slamming them into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a field in Pennsylvania. Now, a few days later, the U.S. Congress passed a sweeping new law called the Authorization for Use of Military Force, the AUMF. It provides the president with broad authority to, quote, use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September the 11th, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States. Now, it's important for you to hear the actual language of that law because it shows just how you can justify certain U.S. military and intelligence activities around the world if there's a connection somehow with Al-Qaeda. Now to Somalia. We know the U.S. has recently increased its on-the-ground military activity against Al-Shabaab forces in support of Somali and African Union forces. But up until now, those activities have mostly been justified as being in self-defense. Some analysts have pointed out that it's now a pretty thin legal justification given that the U.S. appears to be actively involved in battlefield situations. So now, the New York Times, citing unna unnamed U.S. officials, says that as part of the president's regular, regular letter to Congress listing updates to current U.S. military operations abroad, he will include al-Shabaab as part of the groups defined under the AUMF law. If that happens, it will provide U.S. forces soon to be under a Trump administration more power to actively pursue Al-Shabaab using, quote, all net and appropriate force. Daniel Wrenches, CCTV, Washington. In Syria, government forces are making significant gains to recapture rebel-held parts of Aleppo. Rebels have lost all of the northern neighborhoods of their stronghold in the city's east. Allah Ibrahim has more. Syrian army units continue to advance in eastern Aleppo, having already taken 40% of the rebel-held districts of what was once the country's largest city. As the fighting widens, more people tend to flee the violence. By some estimates, more than 5,000 people have left eastern Aleppo and went either into government-controlled parts of the city or into the Kurdish districts of Aleppo. Monday afternoon, Syrian Air Force fighter jets dropped flyers and messages on rebel areas threatening those who decide to stand against the Syrian army and vowing to accommodate and take care of all those who decide to surrender their weapons and leave. The state news agency SANA quoted the Russian coordination center at the Russian air base saying that over 100 militants were given safe passage and another 3,000 civilians were accommodated by the Syrian military. Rebel sources inside eastern Aleppo say that many people are reluctant to leave eastern Aleppo in fear of government prosecution. But a senior field commander in the Syrian army told CCTV that the military operation in Aleppo will go on until the last militant is out adding that Syrian authorities will take care of all the needs of every citizen in Aleppo. Low temperatures dropping to minus one Celsius is just another factor, adding to the suffering to thousands of people stranded by the fighting. As food and water supplies are running short for over 200,000 civilians still trapped in eastern Aleppo. The Syrian city of Aleppo risks becoming a giant graveyard unless urgent action is taken to assist its people. That was the message at a meeting of the UN Security Council. On Wednesday, a barrage of artillery on rebel-held eastern Aleppo killed at least 26 civilians. Meanwhile, UN humanitarian chief Stephen O'Brien didn't mince his words. For the sake of humanity, we call on, we plead with the parties and those with influence to do everything in their power to protect civilians and enable access to the besieged part of eastern Aleppo before it becomes one giant graveyard. Security Council members had been trying to agree a ceasefire for Aleppo. Russia, which is backing the Syrian government with airstrikes, said easing civilian suffering won't happen by ceasing the counter-terrorist operation. Gains by the Syrian army and its allies since last week have brought whole districts of rebel-held territory back under government control and triggered a human exodus as thousands have fled the bombardments. Hey. 